everyone. Uh, my name is Paulo Kalau. I'm the CEO of Evidence Software. And uh, thanks for joining us. You know, I'm, I'm super excited to have uh, as my guest this morning, uh, a dentist that I've, I've long not admired. And uh, it, it's super cool that we're doing this now because I, I've actually never met him in person. But we've spent enough time hearing of each other that uh, you know, it's such a treat to, to have him on. And his name is Dr. John Buzza from Northern California. And uh, I'll tell you why uh, John is unique in, in my mind. I've seen you know, thousands of dentists all through my career, uh, both in my, in my investments in the different lab businesses as well as uh, other dental companies. And John is a unique uh, individual in the sense that uh, not only is he a, a great clinician, he also has a great business mind, and he's a good human being. And so I'm super excited to have John on the show this morning. So John, welcome, and thanks for joining us in this webinar. Good morning, Paolo. I'm honored to be here. Thanks so much for asking me to attend today. I appreciate it. Now, and, the, and what even makes it more special is uh, to, to a lot of the, the people that are logging on now, John's house was actually burned down uh, during the fires in Santa Rosa uh, a couple of years ago. And so, uh, you know, he's now just moved in like literally to, to his new place and he, and he said, okay, sure, I'll do it for you guys. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm grateful and uh, I, I'll ask everyone to bear with us as, uh, as we work through the, uh, a bit of the Wi-Fi lag that we get, but he hasn't even installed this Wi-Fi uh, at home yet. So, John, thanks again. And, uh, You're you know, welcome, Paolo. I, I mean, first and foremost, I, I just wanted to maybe let, uh, you know, our audience know a bit about you and, you know, what type of practice do you have? And actually, before anything, family, kids, is everyone healthy, your team? Thankfully, everybody's healthy. Um, my family's ha happy to be back in our home and, uh, and the, the team is all doing great. So far, everybody's healthy and happy. Oh, that's awesome, that's awesome. Uh, and uh, a bit about your practice and the dental philosophy. Well, that's a really good question because if I, if I rewind back about 31 years, um, I woke up one day in 1989 and I, I looked at myself in the mirror and said, what the heck am I doing? I, I have no idea of how to run a dental practice. And, and so... I happened to be on a bus going skiing with a bunch of dentists. And this one guy turned to me and he said, oh yeah, well I have this new consultant and he's great. And I said, what's a consultant? And so that led me on a path, Paolo. And I realized that I didn't understand how to run the business of dentistry. I was a good clinician, but that was just one little part of it. And so, what I found was that through this first consultant who really uh, was designed 
his practice around teaching dentists how to run a business, it was the best thing I could have done as a young dentist. And I have literally had a dental consultant for 31 years. Now, different ones, because I tend to burn them out. Because <laughs> I'm, gregar <laughs> I'm gregarious. I want to know what's the next thing. How can I make it better? And so, as, as you know, after about eight or 10 years, we, they run out of gas and I have to find somebody with more horsepower. And um, I've been fortunate enough to be with a, a gentleman now by the name of Greg Jack of Capacity Management, who's out of Tucson or uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Amazing guy, great mind, great forward thinker. Um, but but it, what, what it drills down to, you know, when you think about um, anybody who is in any kind of sports, everybody needs a coach, right? So for me, it's about having a coach that can look from 40,000 feet and see me down in the weeds bumping along, bumping into rocks and tree stumps and so forth and tell me, hey, you need to do this to be more successful in your business. And then I just need to do it. So I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how do I develop rapport with patients? You know, I took a lot of courses on Dale Carnegie, public speaking and all of those kinds of things to really figure out how do I communicate well with my patients so that I can get them to encourage them to do more treatment. So that's been a foundation in our practice. Um, marketing internally and externally in our practice has been really, um, I found early on, we really need to, to market our practices and we need to learn how to market them yeah. because it's like a moving target. You know, it's kind of like um, if you, put a telescope up in the night sky and I, and I focus it on a star and I said, Hey, Paolo, come over and take a look at this star. And you look in the viewfinder and you don't see anything. And I go, Oh, wait a minute. Let me move the microscope or the telescope. That's what marketing is like in dentistry. It's kind of a moving target. You got to keep playing with it. Um, the, the biggest thing that I found is to have capacity in your practice. So many of us, we wait until we need another assistant or we wait till we need, we're busy enough to have another room. That's the backwards way to do it. What we need to do is be proactive and say, hey, if I want to grow my practice, I need to add an assistant, I need to add a room. And then you've created capacity and it's like having a big catcher's mitt out there. So, so these are some of the philosophies that I've kind of embraced to get where I am in my practice. Um, but more importantly right now, especially now, what I tell my team probably every day, it's about what's happening inside our four walls that's important. There's a lot of chatter going on outside. And a lot of us are being swayed and moved by what's happening and how we've kind of become victims in this whole process. And for me, yeah, I get that. It, it's a reality. It exists. But let's not let that drive what our foundational um, philosophies are in our practice. How are we going to continue to move our practices forward as, as we come out of this, you know, going back to basics, being the strong practice that we've always been and, and kind of, um, uh, for instance, um, Ted Fries, who was the, the lab dude that you had on last week or Monday. Yeah. yeah. You know, one, one of the things that he said was, um, he's come out of every significant challenge over the last three decades stronger than he was before. And I think that's the challenge that we have to make for ourselves. Yeah. I so mean, I guess maybe. Sorry, yeah, go, ahead. go ahead. No, I mean, touching on that. Uh, I, I guess my, my first question is if you'd like to share kind of a, a short description of what your practice is like today. And then, Absolutely. And then how so, how's COVID impacted that? So, um, so well, we're, we're a practice in a community of about 200,000 in a county of 500,000 in Northern California. We're about an hour north of San Francisco up in the wine country. Um, we've, we've got uh, 10 chairs, 14 employees, uh, one of whom is an associate. Um, we, we, try, we have tried to incorporate into our practice as many services as we can so that it's a minimal number of referrals. So we try and do as much surgery as we can, uh, root canals, 
Um, one of the things that we're known for in our community is uh, sedation dentistry. So we do a lot of IV, um, we do oral sedation, we do IM, but in order to do that, people kind of expect to have to be able to get everything done in one visit. So we've taken the time to learn over decades all the procedures that we can do and be proficient at them so that we can provide these services to our, our patients. One of the big things that we've done is spent a lot of time, as I already mentioned with the marketing, is branding our practice and trying to be the leader in the community. Um, so you asked me how this has impacted us, the COVID has impacted us. Um, obviously, we've had to be respectful of all of the mandates and recommendations that have been made by the CDC and the ADA and so forth. But at the end of the day, we need to serve our community. So uh, the first week I was running back and forth to the office three or four times a day, mm -hmm. taking care of emergencies. And I said, well, this is stupid. So <laughs> even though we had to fur furlough 12 of our 14 employees, two of my employees, one front, one back said, hey, look, I'll be there to help you serve the community. So we're there Tuesday through Thursday, normal hours. And son of a gun, if the schedule isn't full every day with emergencies, some are mine, but surprising thing is most of these emergencies are coming from other dental practices whose practitioners have chosen to flat out close and not even see emergencies. So, um, so how it's affected us is unfortunately I've had to send most of my team home and that's really shut down the practice. But on the other side, by making the commitment to serve our community, we're staying busy. We may keep the lights on. <laughs> wow. I mean, you've got the big operation there, 10 chairs. And so, yeah. you, know, you know, in certainly in normal times, uh, it, it's a, a good sized practice. And, uh, you know, even to drop it down to where you are today, I mean, you're still carrying a fair bit of overhead in the, in the infrastructure. How have you managed, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, so how are you dealing with, with uh, uh, expenses in the COVID-19 scenario? So that's a really good question. The first thing I did was freak out because, okay. you know, that big sucking sound that you hear behind me, that's the dollars going out the, through the black hole. And, and so... Then I said, okay, time out, back to basics. What do we do when production is low? How do we manage our practice in a normal situation? As I said, inside our four walls, what we normally do. Well, first of all, we know that hopefully there will be some funds available through the Paycheck Protection Program. And still the federal government as of yesterday changed the rules again on how they're gonna determine what whether or not your your debt will be forgiven and and i jokingly told my wife last night isn't it funny i've been asking for forgiveness my whole life and i still am now with the feds <laughs> it's like <laughs> come on you guys so um and then there's the the eidl the disaster loan which um that's a moving target right now i don't know if there's been any funds released or not, but they started out with a cap of $2 million and, and as of last Saturday, there was a, a notification that they'd reduced that cap from $2 million to $15,000. Okay. Now, I don't know if that's urban legend or not, but it, 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 as I said, so things are really uncertain there. So, so what I've chosen to do is say that's a nice to have. If those funds become available for our practice coming out of COVID, great. It's a bonus, but we still have to manage what's going on. So what's the first thing is what I tied back to is the business of dentistry. One of the things that we should be as practitioners being really careful about making sure that we have some cash on hand, that we're not running on that bleeding edge every day, that we're amassing some cash so that there's enough to carry us through a month. So so cash on hand is kind of the holy grail. And for those of us that, that haven't or been, been able to maintain some kind of a bolus of cash, that would be a really good thing to focus on moving out of this. How am I going to earmark some dollars to keep the, the system 
moving forward in the event of a crisis like this. Um, it's just another business principle in, in managing a, a, a business of any size. Um, so cash on hand is important. Um, now, as you mentioned before, we've just come out of a strange situation with our family and having to rebuild our house. And of course, the insurance company has not come forward with all that they had promised. Yeah. So we've, we've had to augment that. And as a result, it's reduced. It's depleted our reserves a bit. But we still have some to help us through. Um, the other thing is defer all the loans you can. Now, every bank is handling it differently. Some are saying, yeah, we'll just defer everything for 90 days and put it on the backside of the loan. Some are saying you can pay interest only for 90 days. And then at the end of 90 days, that principal hasn't depleted. So you're, you're back to your normal payment. Some are saying, yeah, we'll defer everything for 90 days, but in the fourth month, you owe all the three payments that we deferred plus the fourth one. And I'm thinking, wow, that doesn't seem to make any sense. However, if you know that's the case and you plan for it, you could still have three months without an obligation just to have some flexibility in your life. So any one of those, and actually all three of our banks have given us all three of those scenarios. And we've just decided with my advisors, we've decided to take advantage of it because cash is king. The more you can keep, the better. Now, having said that, I want to, I want to make this really clearly important. We deal with a lot of vendors and that we have personal relationships. It may be our supply companies. It may be our laboratories. It may be the local vendors that are distributing water and you know, plants and whatever they do in our practices. I would encourage all of our listeners to be very respectful of the relationships that they put together for decades, especially the labs like you guys, Paolo. And, and, and I, I'm sorry, I'm making a plug for you guys because I know I've talked to Brent and, and he said, you know, it's, it's, it's gone to a trickle. So how can we pat each other's backs through this? And I think if we have to decide that we need to hold on to some cash, I would be cautious about how we manage our vendors. You know, one of the things I didn't touch on is, is uh, paying our mortgages on our, if we own our own building, or more importantly, if we're a renter or a leaser, go to your leasing company or go to the, the landlord and say, hey, I need you to defer this until I can get my uh, paycheck protection funds, in which case then I can start to be regular. Um, what our landlord has done for us is very generous. He said, I'll give you 30 days and we'll put that 30 days, we'll split that, that April rent, we'll put into six payments and you can pay that one six beginning in June with, along with your regular rent payments. So he's, he's really kind of being helpful and helping us to weather this storm. Yeah. So that's awesome. Those are some of the things that we're doing um, out of this. Now, fast forward, uh, we're now in the, in the heat of, of what I would call the muck. And, uh, yes. What are you doing right now to prepare your practice for when the lights come back on? What are the things you're worried about? And what are the things that you go, you know what, I got this. So um, I've got kind of the 30, 60, 90 day clock in my head. You know, I wish I had my magic eight ball from when I was a kid, but it burned <laughs> up in the fire. Because <laughs> it would have told me exactly what to do. But, um, you know, I think in 30 days, so first, what am I doing uh, right now to prepare? So obviously we've all got some time, right? So let's be proactive. We can wallow in self-pity. Or we can, you know, it, it takes as, as much energy to make ourselves miserable as it does to make ourselves happy. So I'm, I finally, after I freaked out for a day, I decided, okay, I got to focus my energy on the positive. So um, one of the things that I find happens in a busy practice, we're rolling down the track at 100 miles an hour. And we have these ideas of things that we want to make changes in our practices that could oftentimes be significant changes, but they might be small changes that aren't 
that's something that's just kind of a pinch, okay. but we just don't make the change because we're too busy. So for instance, one of the things we've done, I've sat down with my office manager and we're looking at our team members and we're saying, who's our A players, our B players and our C players. And one of the things that I think is going to come out of this is we're going to start to see some practices that maybe shrink or I've had two practices already guys uh, in my decade who have chosen screw it. I'm done. I'm throwing in the towel. We've already had calls from a couple of uh, team members that are highly qualified that said, Hey, are you guys looking for team members? So what we're doing is we're saying, what can, who's our team right now? And who are the C players that maybe we could upgrade to be players? And, and so that's one thing we're doing. Um, another thing that we're doing as an example, I've threatened to go from four days a week to three days a week for, uh, about three years. I'm going to be 65 this, this year. And it's like, wow. God, right. It's like, okay, come on, time out. I need to take a little more time for my family and for my wife and do some, well, we were going to do some traveling, but I think that's off the table for a while. <laughs> right. I so, think so. Yeah. Right. So what we're doing is we're making some, what if projections we're saying, what if I went to three days, what would it look like if we run that through the spreadsheet? And so one of the things that we're thinking is, well, how can we enlist the services of our associate to take on more of the practice? And what would that look like at the end of the day? What would come out the end of the funnel as far as for the practice and, and the profit for the practice? And so we're running some scenarios like that. And so one of the things we're thinking is, well, I need to respect that it's time to make a change. Perfect opportunity to make that change. How about if I go back working four days a week for the first 90 days and then at that during that time, I shrink myself back to, to three days. Um, one of the things that uh, we, we've been working four days, there's no reason why since we already have a team member there on our management day, answering phones and doing billing and that kind of thing, why couldn't we have my associate there and one hygienist? That increases our, our uh, reach to the community by 25% by adding one day, even if it's only eight to two. So that's one thing that we're thinking about because now's the perfect time to make that shift. Before I was always worried about, oh, you know, the team's used to this schedule. I don't want to rock the boat. Well, this is going to be real easy for me to come back and have a whole team meeting set up ahead of time for a full day and say, guess what guys, there's a, there's a new deal in town and here's what we're going to do moving forward. Um, so, you know, I, I actually kind of snickered to myself when I said, we're going to have a full team meeting and, and roll out the whole thing. I thought, what the hell am I thinking? Do I really want to take all those arrows in my butt? You know, but remember, this is our practices. We have to do it the way we want it to be done because otherwise we're never going to be satisfied with our practices. And, and I mean, for a lot of people, it's also a time to, to reflect on whether they're a fit for whatever role they're, they've taken on. They, they, it's, you know, this is a time of reflection, I guess, for, for uh, a lot of folks. Um, we've got a few questions popping up already, so I'm just sure. going to touch on them, uh, John. Sure. First one is, uh, oh, the speaker name, or sorry, the consultant. Uh, the name of the consultant, we'll, po we'll post it after this uh, and get it from you and share it with the folks. Uh, you, you know, Amin Damji is asking uh, a, a number of questions regarding reopening protocol and PPE and whether you've thought that through on how uh, you're going to implement the post-COVID protocol and use of PPE. So. Uh, I'd sure. love you to, to share some of your insight on that. Yeah, we've, we've actually uh, been uh, watching all of the chatter about what's going to happen. And um, there's uh, OSHA has already sent out a document, which I could forward to you after, Paolo, which is a kind of a preliminary get ready for this guy's um, message that they're going to be making some changes. They were very vague about what those changes may be. Um, 
and and PPEs right now seem to be for you know other than the N95 masks, um, other PPEs. There's uh, our vendor um, seems to be fine. Um, they said we're not going to send you any more than your normal order, but we will send you your normal order, and we've been keeping up with our normal order even through this process. So there's a decision. How do I do my cash flow? What we decided is we're not going to hoard, but we made a normal order last week and they fulfilled it. So we actually aren't using our gloves and our masks at the rate we were. So we're going to have a little bit of a, an extra um, load. The other thing I'm being careful about is before I would run between chairs. So I might change gloves four times with one patient. What I'm trying to do now is figure out coming out of this, how can we schedule in a manner that's more um, conducive to using PPEs more conservatively. So um, that's one of the things that, that we're doing. But, but I, there will be some new guidelines, and I don't know how that's going to affect us, but I think we have to be, I keep, the other thing I ask myself, Paolo, through this whole thing is, what would a reasonable person do? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have been practicing a high level of infection control and cross-contamination since AIDS in the 80s. And we keep refining it, refining it, refining it. But there's only so much a practice can do and still be profitable. So we have to use um, a, the, a prudent or reasonable bands. We have to put that hat on and say, what makes sense here? Yes, I understand there's a letter of the law that should be followed, but there's a lot of gray area that I think we need to be um, aware of. Does that answer the question or did I beat around the bush? Uh, a bit of the beating around the bush because I, I think the protocols are not, uh, w in effect what you're saying is the guidelines are being published, but uh, they're still not exactly. cast in stone. And the key is to follow those exactly. guidelines. And I think they'll change as Yes. And, and I mean, uh, we've got a few other questions here I'll touch on. Are you wearing a hazmat suit with FFF3 masks? Uh, are you doing aerosol no, generating procedures? And uh, how, how are you managing social distancing? And how will you do it when the lights come back on? Uh, that's an interesting question. Great question, Patty. So, uh, you know, I may be hanging myself out here, um, but uh, so what am I doing? Um, I'm, I'm putting a surgical gown, I, I'm, I wear scrubs. I put a surgical gown on between patients, um, you know, the taffeta ones. I know the taffeta ones are not a, a hazmat suit and I know they're not, uh, but as far as if someone were to have um, be contaminated, at least I'm taking it off and throwing it away. Um, I change my mask between every patient, obviously gloves. Um, we're using the same protocol we've used forever, wiping down the room, spraying down everything. Um, the, what, what have we changed is we wipe off the door handles and the waiting room furniture between every patient with uh, you know, the disinfecting solution. But other than that, I, part of what I think um, is I get that the virility of this and and how easily it's transferred, but somebody has to serve the community. If if these patients ended up in the hospital in the emergency room, it would be a debacle. And then somebody's going to have to treat them in the dental profession. And so we, as a team, the team members that decided to stay, and my wife and I sat down and, and had a conversation and said, "How how are we going to manage this? How are we going to serve our community?" And that's the solution. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, this seems to be a, a hot topic because we're getting a lot of questions on this and we'll try and, and touch on them. Uh, I'll share with you a personal experience. So uh, as you know, we're in the software business. We deal with, we build software for labs and dentists. And I've been, in, in the last two weeks, I've had about 12 patients uh, reach out to me. And the issue has been, you know, of course, uh, emergencies, whether it's a temporary popping off or, you mm -hmm. know, uh, everything from that to a wisdom tooth. And the 
psychology of the patient population I found is changing. And mm -hmm. to me, that, that was a surprise. Uh, so I had one patient who said, uh, well, you know, I don't really want to go into my dentist's office and wait in the waiting room with, you know, three or four other people. And so right. how do you schedule it uh, so that, you know, I go in there when the other guy's gone? That kind of thing, right? And, right. Uh, so it, it, it was an interesting, uh, I guess, statement to what patient expectations will be when this thing is, sure. is all over. Because, you know, they're, they're looking around going, I, I wonder if the guy beside me uh, is COVID positive or not, and they're freaking sure. out, right? And so, I mean, in, in essence, I, I don't know if I told you the story, but even my son who was in the East Coast and his dentist is in Vancouver, uh, he was uh, having problems with a wisdom tooth. And uh, that's actually why we ended up building a teledental platform is I got so frustrated right. that, uh, you know, I wanted my, my son in the lab and, and uh, the dentist to talk through uh, a situation. Sure. And uh, w they were having a hard time doing it. And so I said, oh, what the heck, we're going to build something so that people can deal with this. And, we can even schedule how people walk in and out of the practices. So that, that was the, the motivation for us. But what do you see uh, is happening to the patient population, you know, when the lights come back on? Uh, well, there, there's a couple of things. First, I wanted to camp on what you just said about the, the virtual. Um, mm -hmm. it is I, I see other companies coming out with similar types of platforms, and I think it's a brilliant idea because as patients, as we come out of this and patients start to feel, they're still, they're feeling uncertain about whether or not they should expose themselves. I think that um, having the opportunity to do a virtual consultation with the, with the doctor or someone in the practice is brilliant because it will break the ice. It will get them feeling comfortable Absolutely. about, is this a place that I even want to dip my toe in the water? Um, so I think that's important. There's two other factors that I think are important. One is, in theory, we've all been sheltering in place. And in theory, it's a 14-day incubation period. So if after a month, people have been respecting that, then there's a very small percentage of patients that will actually be contaminated. Most will have either exhibited the symptoms or have not been exposed and won't exhibit the symptoms by now. So part of what my comfort level, maybe I've reasoned myself into a false sense of security, is that people who were infected or may have been infected are probably already past that infectivity time. The other thing is, especially in California, what the researchers are beginning to say is that we are now experiencing what they're calling herd immunity. That they're, back in November, when the first case was um, came out in November 17th in China, there were 8,000 Chinese nationals arriving in California on airliners a day, and many straight from the Wuhan province direct flights. So um, a researcher, Hansen at um, Stanford's Hoover Institute came out with a white paper last week that says that he believes that it was already here in November and December, and it's gone, and that now we're ex experiencing what they call herd immunity. A matter of fact, um, in Sonoma County, as of yesterday, the infection rate is 0.08% for the whole county of 500,000 yeah. people. So, so and, and I saw it in my practice, and uh, uh, patients who are uh, working in the medical profession say, they basically saw it come through in November, December, in the first week of January, and then it was gone. So okay. this is really smoke and mirrors, Paolo. Well, I mean, uh, as you know, I'm a microbiologist, so we've had long discussions right. about these things. And, uh, yeah, exactly. that, that we, we definitely have, uh, in, my, in my mind, uh, you know, there, there's tragic consequences to killing an entire economy and uh, weighing that with, you know, whatever risks are, it's really, it has to be a very much a data-driven uh, 
approach because like you said the data you're getting is very different than you know what everyone else this is, is talking about and to me that's exactly a concern there um we've got a few other questions here uh what about uv sterilization is that do you think that's necessary um so there was an article that i saw yesterday that came across the wire that um a researcher uh I can't remember what 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 research facility um, said that uh, that the uh, COVID nineteen does respond to UV that that you can kill it with UV. Now there weren't any guidelines. All they said was that it can be killed with UV. Um, but yeah. we all know that heat and uh, so our, I guess we're talking about surfaces because instruments and otherwise are being sterilized in a normal fashion, and we know that's effective for COVID nineteen. So I'm not really, uh, I think that there's not enough information about UV. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's consistent with, with my thinking is that like, uh, there's a lot of stuff being bantered about. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the, the research is showing that it's still soap and water that's most effective. Right. <laughs> and, um, you've got the shout out from uh, uh, Laura Mock that says, uh, she just said, I love that uh, you just mentioned, let's not rock the boat and you've let go of that. Uh, you know, the boat's been rocked, she says, and be free to make a change. So Laura, thanks for, uh, for supporting John Buzzo. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. <laughs> um, I wasn't sure if I was gonna get more arrows today or not with my philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, like I said, I think the, the world is going through a reset and uh, the reset means to me that uh, people are actually reevaluating their authenticity and making their decisions that way. And I mean, you and I have always lived our life based on, we call it the way we see it. And, you know, my patience exactly. for, for uh, people who live their life in a facade isn't very high. So that's why we get a lot right. of people. <laughs> uh, Peter, Peter Kim, uh, he posted the question, when the economy suffered, naturally the elective uh, procedures are going to drop. And so a uh, big drop in overall revenue. What are your thoughts and how do you combat this? I mean, that's a big concern with everyone, right? So um, I I'm really glad, Peter, that you asked that question. Here's why. Um, I, I gave some thought about what's going to happen 30, 60, 90 days out. Now let's, let's roll back to what I said about basic business principles and, and the foundation of one's practice. Um, so I thought about what's going to happen in 30 days. I think there's going to be pent up demand. People are sitting around. Um, I'm already seeing it. My, my prognostication was that this week we'd start to hear the phone ring with regular patients, elective procedures saying, Hey, I'm off work. I got nothing better to do. Can I come in and get some work done? So it's starting to happen. And I believe that um, this pent up demand is going to carry us for, through the first 30 days of, of after the, the veil lifts. Now, 60 days is um, a little different. So let's talk about our competition. So, so I, I think this is what, what you want to hear, hear me say, Peter. It, it was Peter, right? Yeah, uh, it was um, Peter Kim. It, yeah, yeah. So, so Peter, here's what I'm thinking. It's all of dentistry, elective procedures is about discretionary dollars. So, where are it's not a, our competition isn't other dentists. It's it's discretionary dollars. So, what are discretionary dollars? It's new cars, new TVs, vacations, tires for the car. Mama needs a new pair of shoes. You know, it, it's it's basic every day. Where are our dollars going? So now we've got a situation where patients are, have been home, many of whom have not been paid. They've been hoping to get an unemployment check. Maybe it's rolling in or not, but still, there's not going to be a lot of excess when we come out of it after that 30 days into the 60 day mark. So um, the thing is, is that even though we think that it's going to be tighter, it's always tight. It's our biggest challenge in practice is getting patients 
to understand the value of doing the dentistry that's important for their dental health and and sharing with them what are the consequences of not doing it so that's kind of a daily routine in our practice and um so if you've already been practicing that and that's part of the foundation of your philosophy of practice is what are the consequences of not doing this here's some options to getting this done how can i help you get this done mrs jones those are kind of we've we've already exercised those muscles for decades now the plan is moving forward we just need to refine that and go back to those basic business principles of encouraging patients to understand where to spend their discretionary dollars so that's where i think a, a good opportunity for us as practitioners to get with our teams and if we don't have the education get it there's a lot of opportunities out there Get a consultant that, if you don't, that can have that can help you to really do this. So, um, you know, this is unusual. I get it. So, what's my 90-day thing? Is um, well, we don't know what's going to happen in 90 days. I hope that at 60, we're going to have a clearer picture of what 90 days is going to look like. By then, if we've received those uh, the Paycheck Protection Funds, those will have been used because we have to use them in eight weeks. So now we're back to a normal practice with a different world. And uh, so this is where we wanna really put our ownership hat on and look at the practice critically and, and, and see where we're tracking and see where we need to adjust. Do we need to adjust our team? Do we need to adjust our marketing? How about the number of days we're practicing or the number of hours in a day? So, so these are, so I think if we look at this with basic, how would I have done this in the past? Cause think about it, you guys, we've all been through crises. I mean, the 2008 um, recession was one of the worst uh, recessions in history and everybody got it through that and everybody became successful as a result of that because we learned new tools. So that's, I don't know, hopefully that answers your question, Peter. All right. I think that's pretty much all you can do to answer it at this point in time. Um, I've, I've got uh, Anthony Berzan, you know, asking about uh, uh, N95 gowns, caps, booties, HEPA filtration. You know, is it reasonable to say that uh, a dental practice will be a rapid test facility for COVID-19 in the future? I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I, I, you know what? I, I have to confess, I did go online and I bought two HEPA filters that do uh, 500 square feet and I put them in the hallway in the operatories and I put a little sign on them that says HEPA filtration. So at least patients come in and they see, oh, well, the guy's trying to do something. Um, as far as all of the rest of it, I think that there has to be a balance between, one of the things that I look at is, there are certain mandates that are gonna be placed upon us. And how can we make it filter to the bottom line so there's still profitability in the practice and still be taking care of our patients in the manner in which they um, are accustomed. So you know, one of the things that I think uh, we have to be uh, reasonable, again, there's that reasonable word. <laughs> we have to be reasonable. OSHA is going to create, create some mandates. I think for them to come in and say that we have to be in hazmat suits is going to be unreasonable. And, um, you know, hell, you can get booties at, at Home Depot for, you know, a buck fifty for 50 of them. So if we had to do that, great. That's what we do. But um, what I, here's what I wouldn't do. I wouldn't freak out about what it might be. I would continue to practice in the manner that we have in a, as, as a prudent person would and do everything we know how to do now, and then trickle in as the guidelines change. Um, and there's gonna be a, a, a period of time that we're gonna be given to assimilate these new guidelines. And I, you know, I wouldn't show up the first day in a hazmat suit and scare all my patients away. You know, I, would, I would trickle it in and just see what happens because what I believe is it's gonna be like a, a, a bell swinging. It's gonna 
get really, really constrictive initially, and then they're going to find, oh, that's not working so well. It'll come back to the more of a milky branch. Yeah, I mean, what I find interesting, even as I look at the questions, is I get all the uh, projected uh, requirements for uh, disinfection and PPE. Mm -hmm. But no one's talking about what the patient expectations are. And, exactly. you know, from my perspective, if you're a dentist with poor communication skills, where you can't engender trust right. with your patients, mm -hmm. good luck. Right? Right. Because that, to me as a patient, that's what I'm looking for is, you know, do I get to develop trust with this individual? Mm -hmm. And... The challenge dentists have now is that trust has to develop before the patient walks in the door. Bingo. Because now they're considering the door as a risk zone when they walk mm -hmm. in. And mm -hmm. so how do you develop that trust before they actually walk in? Mm -hmm. And I, I've tried to explain that to a number of dentists that we deal with, that are friends of mine. They don't get it. And I go, you guys don't get it, do you? <laughs> so right. anyway, that's my personal opinion. And certainly, I moved dentists because of that. And sure. I let my, my uh, checkbook, you know, speak for me. Is that I went somewhere else. And mm -hmm. uh, it's because there's certain capabilities, especially coming from a software background right. and a generation of people now who are used to Zoom and video conferencing. Absolutely. That we have needs that, that have to be accommodated. And if we're not, then we'll go somewhere else. Yeah. So it's just the way it is. Um, I've got a few other questions. Well, Jim Cope, again, uh, asking about air purification technologies and air scrubbers and so on. Do you know? There, there's ahead. been a lot of... Um, uh, literally in the last three days, um, I've, I've been uh, privy to uh, some communications through the Coist Center, which um, I'm a mentor at the Coist Center in Seattle. And um, the, there's a chat line of about 300 dentists that there's always pitter-patter on there. Well, the last three days, they've been talking about just that, air purification. And um, there's a couple, three that have kind of landed as the ones that are the best for viral decontamination. Um, some that will do up to 800 square feet, some that sit on the wall, um, that can be mounted on the wall so they're not on the operatory floor. Um, I would be happy to uh, go back, Paolo, and dig through those uh, emails and, and just shoot those over to you so that at least it gives our listeners something to begin a search with. But um, there's a lot of products out there that are HEPA filters that um, claim that four to five layers of filtration and are very effective. So, and, and I think, it, so camping back to what you said about communication. So what I've always said about patients is they have no idea what the quality of our care is other than by when they're when they walk over the threshold, what does the facility look like? What does the team look like? How do they communicate with me? That's what I told you early on. I've spent a lot of time getting a lot of education on how do I effectively communicate with yeah. people so that I can relay that to one-on-one -on -one with my patients. And then I have my team dressed sharply. So, you know, business casual with logos and button down start shirts and the facility is clean and up to date. And that's how people gauge you. If I come walking out in a hazmat suit, I don't know how good that's going to go. I think I need to be able to communicate with them one-on-one, -on -one, knee to knee, eye to eye, like the old Dale Carnegie techniques. That's the best way to gain the trust and the rapport with your patient. Uh, I, I've got a few questions here, which I find interesting. And I, I, I hope you don't mind me asking them uh, to you, John, is, uh, at 65, are you concerned about getting COVID and whether you'd be a vector for spreading it to your family? So, uh, truth be told, I believe I had it in December. Um, I got really sick and it was before anybody really knew about COVID. And I actually, 
uh, communicated with my healthcare practitioner and I talked to him about it. And he said, based on the symptoms you're reporting, you've already had it. So, and my, my wife had it. She gave it to me actually, bless her heart. <laughs> um, so, so uh, I believe I've had it. And um, so hopefully I'm antibody positive and, and, and no longer. So, so I'm working under the paradigm that, that I will not be infected and that I'm, I'm already safe. Yeah, and I, I think it's a personal choice as well for you that you, you, mm -hmm. you opted to make those personal decisions and, and care for your and patients it, it, in that way. It was a family decision. You know, we talked about it. My wife is very um, involved in the community. And she said, you know, we've been here 35 years. We can't just go hide under a rock. So, uh, Peter uh, Kim is actually from New Zealand. Hey, Peter, we had uh, John Bachelor from New Zealand on our show the other day, and uh, uh, his question is, uh, uh, you know, it, it sounds like you don't believe uh, locking down the economy is a good thing. And in New Zealand, they've been locked down for four weeks. Uh, you know. What do you think? Like, just an opinion. Oh, man. <laughs> Are you really going to ask me that? I, it was Peter Kim that asked that question. I'm just... God uh... darn it. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah. From the beginning, I have felt that it's, it's a, a very, very slippery slope that we're walking. And, and that we need to be very careful because... In the, in the case of California, I know I'm being self-serving when I say this, we're the fifth largest or we're the fifth largest economy in the world. So to shut down that and, and have the potential for all of these small businesses to, to be on the ragged edge or fail is I think that possibly some decisions could have been made differently. When we look, one of the things I've been looking at is if you just go look at how many people die a day on the highways in, in, in the United States, it's far more than will die from COVID. And we don't close the highways. So I, I'm having to scratch my head to understand. Um, we've, had, we've, we've weathered a lot of storms. And I think the knee-jerk reaction to this may have been overplayed a bit. And that we need to maybe let that bell swing back, that pendulum swing back to the center a little bit. Um, yesterday, the feds made a statement that, that, that they're okay with the states opening up at their discretion. Well, the states always already have had their own discretion. So for the fed to say that is kind of a moot point. But I think that our state governors need to start to look at the statistics and look at the curve and, and, and realize that there is going to be some level of, of infectivity coming out of this and the, and the curve may bump a little bit, but we've got to get people back to work because it's unsustainable. The, the government can't print that much money or borrow that much money and be viable moving into the future. This could create a hardship for our children's generation. So I've got the... Uh, uh quite a vocal uh, audience member, Paddy McGibbon, who's uh, telling me seriously, uh, and uh, all in, in large caps. And you know, the, the beauty of what uh, we're doing in this show is that's why it's called an open mic, Paddy. You know, people are allowed to think the way they want to think. It doesn't mean that they're enforcing that on you. Uh, I know exactly. firsthand, for example, I know firsthand, in the case of Vancouver, where, where I live, uh, we have uh, been practicing social distancing for over four weeks now. So I'm at home, you know, we're fortunate to have a, a place where the kids and, and, you know, the pets and everyone can roam. Uh, but having said that, my, uh, three of my sisters are frontline healthcare workers. In fact, uh, one of my sisters is in charge of the COVID response uh, group at uh, one of the local hospitals. And so uh, as of last Sunday, uh, my brother-in-law was being sent 
home with not enough patients coming through the door. And I think it's been widely documented that uh, in British Columbia, Canada, the response in flattening the curve has been done really well. Or uh, given that you, there's a relatively healthy population here, you know, the people are saying it's because uh, most of the, the issues with COVID have been comorbidity, meaning, you know, they've had uh, at least two other issues that, that combined with COVID that uh, uh, the impact has been relatively mild. We have 4,000 empty hospital beds as of today. So uh, in all fairness, Patty, I, I don't buy into the all caps that you've got and I'm happy to debate you offline. You know, we all have an opinion here. So uh, fire away, John. Uh, what do you think? Wow, we got a whole bunch of questions here as well. Uh, CE for the webinar. Actually, uh, we debated about giving CE or not, and we chose not to. And for one reason, uh, there are a lot of dentists who are CE junkies that jump around taking CE to CE. I call them the dabblers. And we really wanted to avoid the dabblers because they usually don't end up uh, you know, being successful at a lot of things. I'm just being straight up, you know? And you know me, John. I mean, I've, I've dealt right. with every single major dentist in the world from sure. who's who. And there is a distinct pattern of what makes dentists successful in treating patients and in, in their enterprise. And that pattern is very well defined. And then there's a pattern of dentists that actually don't do well. And that pattern's very mm -hmm. well defined. You know, mm -hmm. if you're spending 99% of your time taking clinical courses, I'd, I'd be uh, resetting that ratio. So mm -hmm. anyway, but that's Absolutely. me. Uh, and then we're ending the end, or we're uh, towards the end of our, our show now, John, and I, I didn't realize we're almost an hour of yapping away here. Uh, it's been very enjoyable. Where did that go? <laughs> uh, any parting words on how do you prepare your practice when the lights come back on? Because we all know it's going to be far more competitive when the lights go back on. Um, so, you know, here's the thing. If you base the future on the past, you're going to be successful. So, you know, when the, fertili when the fertilizer hits the ventilator, as it is right now, <laughs> um, it's, it's always important to go back to your basic. Just go back to basics. Go down to your, back to your foundation. What do you know works in your practice? Um, you know, um, what's, what's, so I'm going to share something with you that comes from Rob Flintum, a dear friend of mine who owns and operates Practice Enhancement Group in San Diego, California. Um, mm -hmm. He's been a dear friend for 20 years. Um, he consults to dentists not just on their, um, their practices, but on their lifestyle and how the, engine, the practice is an engine for their life. And years ago, he shared with me something that I've embraced, and it's really helped me to become more effective at weathering these storms is he talks about three hats that the dentist wears. Dentist wears the clinician hat, the manager hat, and the ownership hat. Now, most of us are really happy and comfortable in our clinician hat. We love to be a clinician. Don't bother me. Just give me a drill and let me go to work, right? That, that's typically our lives. Now, we put the management hat on once in a while when we have to, like we have an employee challenge or something operational that one of our managers can't handle. So we've got to step in and, and, and manage that situation. But the ownership hat, that never goes on. It goes on, well, it's time to pay quarterly taxes and there isn't enough money in the checking account to pay the quarterly taxes, so what the hell am I going to do? Or it's tax time and you, you have to figure out pension plan contributions and all that kind of stuff. But most of us don't even get a P&L for 90 days after the end of the last period. And by then it's a meaningless number. So, you know, we aren't, we aren't 
tracking, we aren't looking at tracking sheets, we aren't evaluating what's happening in our practice on a month to month basis. What are the trends? Because let's think about this. What, so I, I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, Paolo, when I, when I ask this rhetorical question is what, what is the act, what is the action that comes out of identifying a trend? It's to change our behavior, right? So if we never look at trends and, and understand what's happening in our practice, then we can't change our behavior and do something that would be effective. So, um, uh, I, I got to cut you off soon, John, but fire away. Okay. Okay. I got one more thing to say, okay. and that, that is get your ownership hat on. And the question that I've been asking myself over and over is what am I going to do to be stronger? when I come out of this. And, and I think that's a perfect message to end this with this. How do you sharpen your ax so that you're ready to swing when you get out the door? And uh, exactly. on that note, I want to say a big thanks to uh, all the people who joined our show. And thank like you for I said, listening. You know, it, it's all about opinions here and uh, we're happy to entertain everyone's opinion. And thank you, John. Thanks for all your time. And My pleasure. Next Friday, we have Mark Olson. Uh, again, a very different personality. He's from Newport Beach, and he's got a, a fairly uh, successful cosmetic-based practice. So it'll be interesting to see what he sees in the future there. And uh, on that note, uh, stay safe. I've got some parting words from the evident team. Uh, you know, Anush and Sophie, I'll let you guys cue it up. And... Off we go. So thanks, John. You're welcome. Thank you very much.